uh, some of my, my remarks, which are prepared. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Wow. And, uh, and welcome <laughs> to our alumni reading tonight featuring H. Lee Barnes and Allegra Hyde. Uh, we are very glad you are here. We also want to thank the Piper Center and our English department, as well as Alberto Rios and Jenny Irish and all of our amazing interns who helped make this event possible. And we are thankful as well for Connor Servich and Beth Charles for preparing introductions for tonight's guests. There's a little bit of feedback if anybody's got a thing on that. Is there anybody back there doing that? Or is it me? <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Can you hear me now still? Okay, all right, good. Uh, this series that we started, the alumni reading series, is quickly becoming one of our favorite events, a new tradition for a long established and vibrant creative writing community. One of the things that we are especially mindful of here in this program is our emphasis on the idea of community, programmatically, departmentally, and certainly as we reach out and connect with the local as well as national literary communities in which we all reside. We're also mindful that when a positive and thrilling thing happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. When our alumni publish a book or win a national award, we all share in that joy. Right now, for example, and just down the mall in the Hayden Library, there are 177 books by our creative writing graduates. There are another 77 books on order for that library. And likewise, when our current students and our future students receive good tidings and publish their books and receive great acclaim, as they will, again, so too do we all share in that joy. To pinch from the regrettably and too soon departed Joni Sledge, we are family. And in this family, everyone is one. We have a long established program, and we in the faculty take great pride in the accomplishments of all our graduates. That said, we can pause for a moment on that word pride. Sometimes, historically, the idea of pride has a troubled reputation. In Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, the poet describes what has become known as the great parade of the seven deadly sins. You know, wrath, gluttony, avarice, those guys. And leading this parade is a queenly woman holding before herself a mirror. It's a sexist image. Uh, but the poet is speaking to the idea of pride, not only being chief among the deadly sins, the, but the antithesis of humility and also emblematic of one's vanity. So it may be useful to be cautious around this idea of pride that said all things in their opposites. And we also know that pride can be a recognition of great pleasure and a genuine feeling of meaningful accomplishment, a great thing. Another source of pride is that of healed wounds. Proud flesh says the rancher about the scar that describes the leg of a once wounded and now fully healed animal. We all know the healing power of the arts as we live and breathe our lives. And finally, there is Simba on Pride Rock, the Lion King. <laughs> Here we think of pride as it relates to our family and our social communities. And that describes best my own feelings when we speak of our pride in our program and our graduates. It's a pride grounded fundamentally in humility, and many of us here feel great pride by way of our proximity to this program and the work which comes from it. Astrologically, the constellation of Leo resides naturally in the fifth house. And the fifth house, according to the ancient rules, play, risk-taking, love affairs, and child rearing. Those ancients. Pride, they understood, was a direct embodiment of our humanity and ability to create pleasure and art. Literary lions, they say, and that's just what we have here, a great big and roaring family. Thank you. So hi everybody, my name's Connor, I'm a second year fiction student and I'm uh, really excited to be introducing Lee. Um, I first read the work of H. Lee Barnes in 2012 uh, when Lee and I were actually published together in the ninth issue of our own Superstition Review. Um, and I can remember the experience of reading Lee's contribution, a short story titled The Day Nixon Was Impeached, for two reasons. The first, and Mike, I'm looking at you, um, was because my prideful, slightly younger self um, felt incredibly insecure about being published alongside a story as whole and artistically complete as Lee's. And the second related reason was because the story is, in a word, brilliant. Revolving around a young man who accompanies his brother and his brother's girlfriend down to Mexico so that she can receive an abortion, 
The story wisely set this small, morally ambiguous human drama against the large, very morally unambiguous political drama of the Watergate scandal. Uh, a story that confidently believes in its own intrinsic power to move its reader. It is earnest and powerful and human in a way that few other writers could ever emulate. And uh, these words, I think, could easily apply to every product of Lee's career thus far. Lee served in Vietnam as a member of the U.S. Army Special Forces before moving to Nevada to work in the casino industry. A graduate, a graduate of our MFA program, he has written nine books, a number of which examine, both fictionally and non-fictionally, his time at war and his time as a card dealer, game supervisor, and private investigator in Las Vegas. In 2009, as an instructor in English at the College of Southern Nevada, he was inducted into the Nevada Writers Hall of Fame, and in 2013, he received an Excellence in Arts Award from the Vietnam Veterans of America. Of his first publication, Gunning for Ho, the Boston Review said, this collection is a testament to the humanity of the men who went to Vietnam. But I think the Salt Lake Tribune put it best when they called Lee, quote, one of the greatest writer, uh, one of the finest writers of short story in the contemporary West. Um, and so, with all that said, it's my honor to introduce H. Lee Barnes. Okay, just so it won't be a shocking contrast, I'll put this on, because I know he has his own hat. Uh, I won't talk a lot. Short story or novel? Short story. Short story, okay. You guys will win. But this has a beautiful cover. <laughs> and the content's not too bad. <laughs> Come on. I used to know where it was. There it is. Sometimes they hide on you. Title of this is Candescent. The house had been perfect for three, but Hazelton was now one. One day a wife and a son, the next day empty rooms. No Edie, no Randy. He turned pictures upside down, stared at the newspaper, switched on his computer, then went and sniffed the clothes in his closet to decide which needed cleaning. He was distracted, tried to keep his mind off the empty rooms until finally the void got to him. He turned on the car's ignition and sat in the garage staring at a radio. How long would it take, he wondered. Carbon monoxide. He'd read somewhere but he couldn't recall where that suicide was the one cure, sure antidote to loneliness. But he was not about to end his life, not with clothes to take to the cleaners. He'd just be feeling one emptiness with emptiness and someone else would find him and see the clothes in the backseat of the prelude and think it pathetic, him and his dirty laundry. Hazelton opened the automatic door, backed out, and drove for an hour, aimlessly until he stopped at Starbucks on West Sahara for coffee. A woman in line in front of him carried a Pomeranian. She was attractive in her mid-thirties and seemed utterly unaware of anyone else as she cooed to her dog. He took his coffee outside. He looked around the patio and wondered what was the purpose in all this. Certainly, it wasn't coffee. Uh, it seemed everyone, especially those on cellular phones, was trying to Fill his life with something tangible, conversation about his job, and overpriced muffins, and coffee so strong it coated the throat, roles, illusions. Perhaps it was not illusion. Perhaps their lives were completed here. Perhaps this wasn't, wasn't a stage, and they weren't actors. Perhaps, Hazelton thought, he was just bitter. Being with others made him feel worse. He drank, he drank half his coffee and tossed the cost the rest. He drove around again until he was downtown. Maybe he thought, this will do, do me good. He parked by the old courthouse, old only by comparison as nothing in Vegas was old. He strolled up to Fremont Street. He remembered the excitement he'd felt as a teenager when he drove up and down the famous street, tourists gazing at, <clears throat> at neon and kids in cars honking and waving to one another. He'd not yet witnessed the phenomenon called the Fremont Street Experience. From Fifth Street, he looked down Fremont, where Fremont intersected with Maine. It was a mall now, a footpath for quarter slot players and panhandlers. The glitter gone, like Edie, like Randy. The experience proved in daylight no experience at all. Laser lights, technology. 
He looked at the canopy, screening the sky and the tops of the hotels from view, and shook his head. He recalled cruising here as a teenager, the hunger of hormones, slow rides west from the Blue Onion up Fremont to Main Street and the old Union Pacific train station, talking to girls in their parents' station wagons, passing open cans of beer back and forth, car to car. That had been an experience. He strolled east down Fremont Street, where a few landmarks remained from his youth, the El Cortez. He'd puked on the carpet in the lobby on graduation night. To the north on Ogden Street was the Orbit Inn, where in 1966, an AWOL soldier had fired a pistol into sticks of dynamite, killing himself and five others. He remembered the sick feeling in his stomach when he'd driven by the crumbled cinder blocks of the old or Orbit Inn. The sensation was easy to recall now because that was exactly what he felt two weeks ago when he came home to an empty house. How long had she planned it? How carefully? It was warm and clear, a pleasant day. Though he, was <clears throat> though he was beginning to sweat, he enjoyed the walk. As he walked, he thought about watching, watching table action, reviewing videotapes from surveillance cameras. He was a spy of sorts, a voyeur, privy to the silent drama of gambling. He watched hands and scrutinized detail, counted cards and totaled roulette payoffs, constantly looking for something irregular. Except on Fridays and Saturdays when Lisa doubled back from the morning shift, he worked alone, sitting on a catwalk with opera glasses or in front of the three dozen monitors that scanned the casino. He was worth his paycheck and more. Traffic moved steadily in both directions. Car tires whistled on the pavement. Noise and movement were welcome. How long had it been since he'd walked on a busy street, home to work in his Honda with the air conditioner blowing air in his face and back again? Every other week, he'd take an Edie out for dinner on Wednesday, their one day off together. Those were supposed to be romantic nights, but more often than not, they returned home and Edie brushed her teeth and went straight to bed while he stayed up and tinkered with the computer. On alternate Wednesdays, he took Randy to a movie or to Lake Mead or Mount Charleston where Edie, while Edie took guitar lessons. But he'd remember the drama of the casino below, played out in his mind, trying to read lips or expressions as piles of chips passed back and forth in a never-ending tug of war. He'd come to accept the dim, silent world where often only words spoken in a week's time were over direct lines to the casino floor or the security office. Except for the highest levels of manage management, no one knew him by sight. His meals were delivered by room service on a tray placed outside the monitor room. He urinated and washed his hands in a private bathroom. He rarely engaged in small talk, even with Lisa, and only once or twice with Jules Arberg, his boss. Below the catwalk rose a constant clatter of machines, music, human voices, but it was all one muted noise as it passed through the ceiling into his work world. He'd separate, right, separated life into work and home, silence and sound. Now there was just a shifting of setting. He ended up alone. Near 15th Street, Hazelton found himself standing in front of a bar named Candescent. Its door, it, <clears throat> its door was painted black and facing was brick. And he remembered from years before, by, he remembered it from years before by another name he couldn't recall. Now it was wedged between a topless bar and a souvenir store. Surrendering to impulse, Hazelton opened the door. For the first time in nine years, he ventured into a bar, a downtown bar at that, with a name like Candescent, why not? It smelled of beer and cigarette smoke, stale air of pie crust, just air as stale as pie crust left out overnight. A shaft of light from the street spread out on the bar top like a pool of burnished liquid. Voices hummed. A slot machine handle cranked up and down again. The bartender squinted in Hazelton's direction and told him to shut the door. The customer's eyes, lustrous as smudged chrome, seemed to shrink away from the light. Hazelton stepped in and let the door close. After taking a moment to adjust to the light, he headed to the stool at a bar and ordered a rum and tonic with a twist, a drink he'd ordered in the days before he and Edie married. The bartender set the drink in front of Hazelton and asked if he wanted to run a tab. Fine, Hazelton said. He wanted to keep the conversation to a minimum. He refused to be one of those who, after a few drinks, starts telling his woe is me to a bartender. He needed to be out of the house, was all. 
no conversation, nothing about Edie leaving, nothing about her or a lover or a seven-year-old boy in an empty house, trash talk. Hazelton noticed a karaoke mic and speakers on the stage. This was what he needed. This would fill a bill. People singing off key renditions of Presley or Joplin. That would keep his mind occupied. Yeah, anything. Last Friday, Lisa had suggested support group to talk his way through a breakup and restore his self-esteem. Hazelton thought it an interesting but cynical idea, the notion of a divorce recovery group. Twelve steps to what? Another marriage? Lisa was a, Lisa was a fine video analyst but a slave to pop psychology. None of that for Hazelton. Rum and tonic and some bozo singing Heartbreak Hotel off key was ther therapy enough. He'd get back to his old self. But what old self? How far did he have to go back? How far did he have to revert? Go, go to revert to what he had been? When does the karaoke start? Hazelton asked the bartender. A woman two seats down turned and looked at him as did a man beside her. Karaoke, the bartender said. Hazelton's eyes had adjusted to the dim light so he could read the name monogram monogrammed on the bartender's shirt, Brady. Hazelton pointed to the stage. Yeah, when does it start? You've never been here before. No. The bartender nodded and glanced at the woman who'd turned to see him. I'm sorry. Uh, there was a moment of silence and ice swirling as they looked at their drinks. Starts in a few minutes, the bartender said. You ready for another? Hazelton downed the drink and nodded. Conversation dropped to a murmur. Hazelton saw that besides himself, a cocktail waitress and the bartender, there were perhaps 12 people in the room. One man sat at a stool in front of a slot machine and cranked the handle down slowly and mechanically as if working a machine in an assembly line. The others sat mostly alone at tables in or, or in booths. Except for one couple and those seated at the bar, none were paired up. Hazelton felt as if he were outside looking in. He sipped a second drink. Slowly, a woman sitting at a booth on the, mon on the other side of the bar slid out of the seat and walked to the stage. Hazelton imagined that she looked the way Edie might in a few years, slender, tallish, straight back. She wore a floral print silk dress that covered her to the ankles. Her skin was bone white and smooth and her dark hair was long and rolled up the top of her head, exaggerating her high cheekbones. She might have been older than he first suspected, maybe 55, he guessed. She carried a cigarette to, in her left hand. With her right, she clasped the microphone. She'd... <clears throat> she... <clears throat> let's see, where was it? She carried a cigarette in her left hand. With her right, she clasped the microphone tapped it gently with the, jet, with the cigarette hand and asked if Brady could hear it. We hear you, Angie, the bartender said. Go, gal, a woman two seats down said. Hazelton signal, signaled for a third drink. He wondered what she was going to sing, probably some bad Julie London or worse, he figured. She took a long draw on the cigarette, rested it in an ashtray, and exhaled as she held the microphone, microphone to the side. A drift of cigarette smoke snaked across the space. Hazelton noticed that she was an older Natalie Wood, had the star lived. Lights, she said. Brady flipped the switch below the bar and the stage went black. She stood as if behind a curtain and placed the microphone near her mouth. The man playing the slot machine stopped. My name's Angie. I've got a story, she began. I was 27 and living in the Hollywood Hills. I could look out and see the city at night. Lights strung out like 10,000 dreams. Miles of them. One was mine. What is this? Hazelton asked as the bartender set the drink down. Shh, listen, Brady said. Angie talked about being a woman in a soap ad and diving into a blue lagoon for a travel commercial. She looked too much like Natalie Wood, a tall Natalie. She spent years living on hope, auditioning, but never getting the parts. She talked about trips to Europe with a movie producer who went unnamed. Occasionally, she'd pause to smoke. Her porcelain cheekbones reflected the glow as she sucked on the cigarette in the dark. The bar was silent. She said her career led to her starring in two porno films. She was from Pocatello, where hard work, basic Christianity, and homemade bread fed the population. But somehow, the film circulated around the town and her father saw it. He killed himself. Age 27, she died, uh, dived off a pier in Santa Monica wanted to die as Natalie Wood had. 
I looked like her. That was my curse. It's important to look like yourself. The woman stepped off the stage and, <clears throat> and hurried to her booth where she quickly hurried to a booth where she quickly downed a drink. The bar flattened into silence. Hazelton realized that he'd not thought about Edie the entire time Angie was on stage. One and two at a time, her audience softly applauded. Hazelton motioned to Bradley, Brady, Brady, who had just turned the stage lights on. What is this, he asked. A bar, people, Brady said. No, I mean, hell, you know what I mean. Maybe you've come to the wrong bar, Brady said. Hazelton shook his head. He remembered the bar now. It had a story. It seemed important to Hazelton to let Brady know that this was a place that had a story. When I was a kid, this place was robbed. A man, a man was killed, a customer. He was trying to get out of the bar because he was on parole and didn't want to go back to prison. It's the place, all right, Brady said, and placed a bowl of peanuts in front of Hazelton. Here, nibble on these and nurse, your drink, nurse that drink. He smiled at Hazelton. The man stood up from his stool and nodded to Brady, who nodded in return. He was a big, stoop-shouldered man, balding but not yet bald, and like Angie in his 50s. Hands in his pockets, he labored to the stage, quickly lifted the mic, and turned his back to the audience. Brady shut off the lights. This time there was no cigarette, just a wide shadow that shifted about uncomfortably as the man spoke. His name was Alan Tate, and he'd played professional football, a center, he said. He talked about his hands, how over the years they'd been pulverized and were now mutilated. He hated to have people see them. The rest of his body was broken up, but it was his hands, he insisted, his hands. Holding your, hiding your hands is like hiding your face, he said. As the old athlete stepped down from the stage, Brady turned, turned on the lights. The man's hands were buried in his deep, deep in his pockets. Hazelton wanted to ask exactly what kind of bartender Brady was and what kind of bar this was, but something more pressing was on his mind. A woman in her 20s mounted the platform. She was short and wore a Stetson hat and cowboy boots. She said she was Emma and didn't mind if people looked at her. Brady left the stage lights on. She paced back and forth on the 10 by 10 foot platform, her head down, never facing the audience. She hit a million dollar blackjack, uh, jackpot at age 21. It was gone. She paced, and she paced and listed the many ways it had gone. Bad investments, booze, cocaine, clothes, desperate men to keep her boyfriend, desperate then to keep her boyfriend. She'd given the last of it to him. He took it and ran, did me a favor. I work construction, flagging traffic, and I got me a horse. I'm done, don't applaud. She walked off walked to her table and took a business-like drink from her glass. Hazelton felt an impulse to talk about the bar's past, to say that places have stories as well, like the Orbit Inn, but places can't tell their stories. He called Brady over. Brady looked at Hazelton's half-full glass. Bit early for another drink, he said. Hazelton remembered holding the girl's hand in Lorenzi Park as she cried. He'd wiped her tears away and, and the next day had escorted her to the funeral. That guy who got shot, Hazelton said, I dated his niece. He wasn't a bad guy. He killed a man in a car accident and I know the story, Brady said. Brady was no more than 30 himself. Hazelton shook his head. You couldn't have been more than three years old. Two. I was two. Quiet now. This is Gus. You have to hear Gus. But Brady raised his finger in silence. Hazelton nodded and turned to the stage. My name's Gus. You know me, sort of. I died and came back, they say. I've had a woman's heart in me for, years, for 11 years. I didn't know that young woman. She didn't know me. A stranger gives a stranger life. Maybe some of you would say I don't have much of a life. Could be. Hazelton recognized a slot player who had been playing, pulling the handle until whatever this was began. He was in his 70s, Hazelton figured, a retired golfer type, fueled by hot air but harmless. It was obvious he was nervous or suffered from some kind of palsy as his hand trembled when he took the microphone. I landed, to sold, I landed soldiers in Normandy, June the 6th, year of our Lord, 1944. Couldn't tell if they were thrown up from choppy water or fear or both. Some of them were praying and so was I. To tell the truth, guess what you had to do in those days was clearer than it is today. I don't know what else to say. I lived a long time since, but that's what I remember. Thank you. The woman at the bar said, you're a good man, Gus. 
The old man walked back to the stool without comment, took a quarter out of the tray, slipped it in the slot, and pulled the handle. The woman at the bar patted her companion's leg, stepped away. The man watched her walk toward the stage as if he, as if he were a boy watching a parade. She glanced at Hazelton as she stepped to the stage and winked. Don't expect much, she said. What's that mean? Hazelton asked Brady as the woman settled herself before the mic stand. You'll see. Hazelton was bewildered by what he was witness witnessing. These were people who sat at the tables he watched. Tops of heads, hands holding cards, the ordinary people whom he'd watched over the years. What urge? What had pulled them away from their games and brought them to the candescent to give voice to their, what, despair? What started this, he asked. Brady shrugged. Doesn't it matter? Does it matter? Listen. He stepped away. I'm Laura. She seemed to pick up Hazelton out of the bar to look at. I left my husband 12 years ago, left him because he was a dead end. He, we had a house, two cars, a daughter, a dog, a few debts, the American dream. She stood with both hands behind her back and leaned into the microphone as she looked at Hazelton. Hazelton stared back as she described her life then, the routine of work and housework, of running errands, picking the right coffee for breakfast, and hurrying to, the beauty, and hurrying to beauty appointments. She said the worst thing of all was that as she began to sabotage the marriage, her husband compl never complained. He'd become a slave to complacence, and that terrified her. All the while she spoke, she looked at Hazelton, and he at her. He was a decent man, never abusive, never cruel. I had no particular complaint, except that I felt I was dead already. One day I packed my car, drew out half of the cash from our accounts, quit my job, took my daughter, and left with another man. I didn't love that man. He didn't love me. He was my way of making the break absolute. I'd like to have a drink now. Thank you. She winked, <clears throat> she winked again at Hazelton as if to ease his thoughts. Had his crime been complacence? For an instant it seemed she was Edie in another body, just as the story seemed to be Edie's story. Then Laura rushed down from the stage into the arms of the man waiting to, at the bar. Hazelton swallowed hard. He knew with absolute certainty that Edie was gone for good, that his life was demarcated by her leaving. There would be the time before her and the time since he wondered where she was and if she understood as he now did. You ready for another, Brady asked. Another? Yes. Tell me. What is this? It explains itself, Brady said, rum and tonic. For a long time, the bar was silent except for the slot grinding, the clatter of ice against glass, and then the occasional flaring of a cigarette lighter. No one mounted the stage. Hazelton bowed forward, his head over his drink, which he swirled about without tasting. He spent much of his life spent over the same desk imagining, uh, examining videos or over a one-way glass watching table action in a casino. It was tedious work that required attention, too much attention to detail, things less trained eyes couldn't see. He'd spent much of his life watching others and had overlooked the details of his own life. How much of Randy's life had he missed already? He wanted to know his son, wanted to hear his voice. Edie would understand. She wouldn't be hard about that. He'd fix Randy's room up, and they'd sit in the bed and talk and talk, or see movies. Yes, Hazelton. Yeah, Hazelton could do that. Brady stood before him and coughed to get his attention. Do you need more time? Time? Hazelton asked. Yes, they're waiting, you know. For me? You. It's easy. Go ahead, Brady said, his voice friendly and soothing. But what would I say? Brady shrugged. Hazelton could leave. The door was only a few feet away. Surely he could leave. He looked around the bar. Eyes gazed back. Folks smiled, or did they? He should leave here. Now, he thought. They couldn't stop him. But something was keeping him there. The girl's name, he said, the one whose uncle was killed here. It was Germaine. We called her Jerry. I know, Brady said. They're waiting. Waiting. Yes. The first time's the hardest. Hazelton took a deep breath and slipped off the bar stool. It was a short walk to the stage, but a shorter walk to the door. He hesitated. He seemed lost. Words were shaping themselves inside his head. He wondered what his story was. Did he have one? A real story. Go on, Brady. You're doing fine. Go on, Brady said. You're doing fine. 
Hazleton moved one foot, then the next, again and again, until he had to step up to mount the stage. The bar seemed lighter here, as if there were candescent lights in every corner. He took his position behind the microphone, but again he hesitated. Go ahead, son, the old sailor on the slot machine said. As he reached for the mic, Hazleton recalled the incident at the Orbit Inn. What was that soldier's story, the real one that ticked inside of him? What was anyone's story for that matter? Edie's story. There seemed to be one in Hazleton now, but it was clogged inside his throat like a great flow of water contained by a fire plug. He held the mic and looked out. He saw Laura who winked and her companion who gave Hazleton thumbs up. Hazleton took a shallow breath, shallow breath and said, my name's Patrick. The rest came out, not like a geyser from a fire plug, but in a slow, steady stream of words that gathered themselves into a small but urgent truth. Thank you.